we talked about FOL interpretations and about truth on FOL interpretations. And in this part of the lecture, I want to discuss some of the examples that came up in the previous part in a little more detail. So here's a step-by-step -step method that you can use for assessing the truth of existentially quantified sentences on a given interpretation. The method proceeds in four main steps. First, you need to identify the embedded open formula A that is embedded within the scope of the existential quantifier. So for example, if you are assessing the truth of the sentence, there is an X, which is F, the embedded open formula is Fx. In the second step, you need to give each object in the relevant domain of quantification a name. Sometimes you are assessing the truth of your sentence relative to an interpretation that already gives each object in your domain a name. In that case, that step is easy. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you need to do a little more work and go ahead and assign names to objects that have previously been unnamed. In the third step, you then need to form all possible sentences that result from replacing the unbound variable in your open formula A by one of the names you assign to objects in your domain in step two. We will look at an example of how that goes in just a minute. And then in the fourth step, you need to assess the truth of the sentences you formed in step three. And the existentially quantified sentence then is true if and only if at least one of the sentences you formed in step three is true. So let's look at an example. Suppose we want to assess the truth of the sentence there is an X, which is F, relative to the interpretation that I'm describing here on the left-hand side. So our domain, again, includes Anna and Berda. Um, we have a number of sentence letters that we have interpreted. That doesn't really matter for our purposes here. Then we are interpreting the name A to refer to Anna and the name B to refer to Berda. Um, the predicate F includes only Anna in its extension, so it applies to only Anna and not to Berda. And the predicate G is a two-place predicate that applies to the ordered pair consisting of Berda as first member and Berda as second member. Okay, so we want to assess the truth of the sentence, there is an X which is F relative to this interpretation. First step, we need to identify the relevant open formula. In this case, that formula is fx. Second step, we need to give each object in the domain a name. Now, thankfully, our interpretation i already does that for us. So we are using a to refer to Anna and b to refer to Berda. In the third step, we need to form all sentences that result from replacing the variable x in our open formula fx by one of the names that we assigned in step two. So in this example, that gives us two sentences, namely fa and fb. In the fourth step, we need to assess the truth of the sentences that we formed in step three. And here fa is true and fb is false. Why is that? Well, A refers to Anna, and Anna is in the extension of the predicate F. That's why FA is true. Now, B refers to Berda, and Berda is not in the extension of the predicate F. And that's why the sentence FB is false. And now the sentence, there is an X which is F, is true, since the sentence FA is true. Here's a second example that's very similar to our previous example. The only difference really concerns the third part of our interpretation. So the interpretation that we are looking at here 
gives a name to Anna, but doesn't give a name to Berda. And so when I want to assess the truth of the sentence, there is an X, which is F, relative to this interpretation, I need to make sure in the second step that Berda gets a name. So in the second step, I am defining a new interpretation that I'm calling I B Berda. And I B Berda is just like the interpretation I, except that it uses the name B to refer to Berda. So the interpretation of the name A remains unchanged. I B Berda is an interpretation that uses the name A to refer to Anna. But now I B Berda uses the name B to refer to Berda. And that's where it differs from our original interpretation I. And the rest of the assessment then proceeds as before. I form my sentences F A and F B. I assess the truth of my sentences. F A is true, F B is false. And then I um, can conclude that the sentence, there is an X, which is F, is true on the given interpretation, since F A is true on my modified interpretation, I B Berda. So here's a somewhat more complicated example. We have the same interpretation as before, in example two. However, we are now looking at a more complicated sentence. We are wanting to assess the truth of the sentence, there is an X such that G B X. So we are again going to assess the truth of the sentence in four steps. First, we identify the relevant open formula. In this case, that is the formula G B X with the free variable X. Next, we give each object in the domain a name. I'm again going to use the interpretation I B Berda for this purpose. And I'm going to use the name A to refer to Anna. And I'm going to use the name B to refer to Berda. Next, I need to form all sentences that result from replacing the variable X in our open formula G B X by one of the names that I assigned in the second step. So that gives me, in this case, two sentences, G, B, A, and G, B, B. In the fourth step, I need to assess the truth of the sentences that I formed in step three. Now, G, B, A is false, and G, B, B is true. Why is that? Well, B refers to Berda, and A refers to Anna. And the ordered pair consisting of Berda as first member and Anna as second member is not an element of the interpretation of the predicate G. So that is why GBA is false. The ordered pair consisting of Berda and Anna is not an element of the interpretation of the predicate G. However, the ordered pair consisting of Berda as first member and Berda as second member is an element of the interpretation of G. And that's why the sentence GBB is true. And so I can conclude that the existentially quantified sentence, there is an X such that GBX is true, given that GBB is true. More precisely, the sentence, there is an X, G, B, X, is true relative to our interpretation I, given that the sentence G, B, B, is true relative to the interpretation I, B, Berda, which is just like the interpretation I, except that it uses the name B to refer to Berda. Now, in some cases, you may be thinking about domains with indenumerably many objects meaning with more objects that, than you can name. So for example, the real numbers are indenumerable. You are not able um, to construct a list that contains all of the real numbers. So in those cases, the method that we just discussed doesn't quite work, simply because we cannot give all the objects in our domain a name. So in that case, we need to modify our method a tiny little bit. 
Um, so we need to proceed hypothetically and ask ourselves, well, can I find an object so that, so that if I give it the name A, the sentence FA is true? So let's look at an example to see how that works. Suppose our domain includes all the real numbers, so in the numerably many things, we have no relevant sentence letters that we need to interpret, and we are using numerals to refer to numbers in a, in a to-be-expected manner. So we are using the numeral one to refer to the number one, and so on and so forth. And we are interpreting the predicate O so that it includes in its extension all the odd numbers. And suppose that now we want to assess the truth of the sentence, there is an x such that O x. Is this sentence true relative to our given interpretation? Now, first step, we need to identify the open formula. That's O x in this case. In the second step now, we cannot give each of the objects in our domain a name, and instead we are just going to try to find one object in our domain that satisfies the formula O x and give it a name. So here I'm just going to suggest, let's only look at the number five and let's use the numeral five to refer to the number five. And then in the third step, we form a sentence that results from replacing the variable x by the numeral five, and that is the sentence O five. And then we assess the truth of the sentence. So O five is true, because five is, a, is an odd number and therefore in the extension of O. And then we can conclude that the sentence, there is an X such that O X is true since O five is true. So the main difference to what we have done before is that in the second step, we do not name all the objects in our domain and instead just try to find one object that satisfies our open formula identified in step one. Now, we can use a very similar method for assessing the truth of universally quantified sentences. The method, again, has four main steps. Step one, we need to identify the embedded open formula. So, for example, if you are assessing the truth of the sentence all x are f, the embedded open formula is fx. In step two, we need to give each object in the relevant domain of quantification a name if they do not have one already. Um, with the same caveat as before, if you have innumerably many objects, you may proceed slightly differently. In the third step, we form all possible sentences that result from replacing the unbound variable in your open formula by one of the names you assigned in step two. In step four, we assess the truth of the sentences that we formed in step three. And then the universally quantified sentence is true if all of the sentences you formed in step three are true. So really it's the same method as when we assess existentially quantified sentence, except for the last step five here, given that the universally quantified sentence is true if and only if all of the sentences that we formed in step three are true. So let's look at an example to see how this works. We have the same interpretation as before. I'm not gonna go over it in detail. We know it pretty well by now. But now we are wanting to assess the universally quantified sentence for all x, g, b, x. Is this sentence true relative to our given interpretation? Well, in step one, we need to identify the embedded open formula. In this case, that is g b x. In step two, we need to give each object in the domain a name. So I'm going to go ahead and use the name A to refer to Anna, and I'm going to use the name B to refer to Berta. In step three, we form all the sentences that result from replacing the variable x in our open formula by one of the names that we assigned in step two. In this case, and that gives us two sentences, GBA and GBB. Next, we need to assess the truth of these sentences. GBA is 
false and GBB is true, given that the ordered pair consisting of Burda as first member and Burda as second member is in fact an element of the interpretation of G. And then we can conclude that the sentence for all x, GBX is false, given that GBA is false. Okay, what have we accomplished today? We have gotten to know the formal language FOL, and we have thereby proceeded in two main steps. We have first discussed the syntax of FOL, and we have discussed all the different symbols that um, may appear in FOL sentences. We have then discussed how you may form FOL formulas, and we have discussed how FOL sentences differ from FOL formulas. So that was the FOL syntax. And then we moved on to discuss the semantics of FOL. And there we talked about two main topics. We introduced the concept of an interpretation and we explained what it takes for FOL sentences to be true on, and give, on a given interpretation.